All right, all work is done. And uh, last class today. So um, I chose a topic that is a little bit different than the rest of the lectures in the class. Um, and some of these topics will be uh, topics that you might also see in a distributed systems class. So now that you've taken this class and you know a lot about performance, um, you, know, you can go to the distributed systems class and, and also know a lot about what they're talking about. So, okay, so let me, let me get started. Um, so what I want to talk about today is that if you go work for a startup or you go work for Baidu or some company and their responsibility is not to make um, a very fast supercomputing application or not to make a really fast computer vision application on a phone, um, their job is also to be very efficient. But their job is to be very efficient in the data center. Um, so it might be true that many of you will, will work at jobs or internships that have to deal with these issues uh, that I'll talk about today. So I'm going to talk about how to be efficient and parallel and fast in a website in today's lecture. Now, a distributed systems class will also talk about other things that are very important with systems uh, on the internet, such as uh, reliability, the site can't go down, security, privacy. Uh, but those are, those are topics that I'm going to leave for you to learn about in, in, in other courses. I'm going to talk, since this is about efficient and parallel programming, I'm going to talk about parallelism and scalability. So, how many people have, have run a web server on your laptop or on your desktop? So you run a web server, what do you do with your web server? Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, fair enough. Well, if you, if, if, if you have enough songs, then it needs to be very efficient. <laughs> also, okay. I have a server uh, for a website. You have a server for a website. Okay. So let's say, and, and how many, so have, have any of you actually like maybe run Apache on a, on a Linux computer that you manage? No? Have you ever maybe run Wik, uh, Wikimedia or uh, like a wiki or a blog? No? Okay, well that's okay. Um, <laughs> that's okay. So, so the basic loop of a web server, like this is the simplest web server. In fact, in Python, you could probably write this web server in about the right same number of lines in Python if you use a, a framework like Flask or something like that. So here's my web server. While the world does not end, because a web server should never stop or go down, while the world is running, wait for the next request. So let's say somebody wants a song. <laughs> and uh, so the request will say something like, if this is a simple web server, please send me this file. So please send me this HTML file because I want to see this web page. Or please send me this song. Um, uh, if, you're, uh, if you're a streaming, if you're a streaming uh, audio website. So right here I wrote parse request because the input will be like maybe a file name. And so we'll get the file name. We will read the file from disk. We're going to read the file from disk. And then we're going to send the bits, the contents of the file, over the network back to the client, back to the user. So a really simple web server. Now, if, you get, if your website gets very popular, you might have a lot of users. So there might be a lot of people sending you requests. So it is common for a web server to be a parallel program. Because processing requests from different people is independent and can be parallelized. So most modern web servers will create a bunch of threads, or actually usually a bunch of processes, that are running this while loop that I have. So here I created n different processes. And every one of those is just, whenever there's a request, I'll take the next one, and so on, and so on. So 
Let's start applying ideas from the course. Let's say that you have a computer, and your computer has four cores that are hyperthreaded, so eight execution contexts. And many web servers give you the, uh, as a parameter, they give you the opportunity to choose what the value of n should be. So let's think about how you would set n. So remember, let's say that there's eight execution contexts, but also remember that what this program is doing, a lot of it is reading a file. So really quickly, I'd like you to come up with a proposal for how you would choose the number n. For example, would you set n to 2? Would you set n to 8? Or would you set n to some other number? So, so give that a, a quick thought, really quick. How would you set the, uh, the, number, the parameter n in this case? Okay, talk about that for one quick second. So what can somebody give me one suggestion? How would how would you guys set n? What would be your answer? Let me see on the how many uh, how many incoming requests are ah, okay. Good, I'm glad you said that. So that's one good starting proposal. You are gonna create exactly as many processes for every incoming request. So every time there's an incoming request. We're going to add a little bit of code here which says create new process and handle it. Okay, that's a valid answer, but there are some other possible valid answers and we'll come back and talk about all of them at the end. So, what's another answer? Who would set n to 1? Nobody wants to set n to 1. Okay, what are other answers that you came up with? Anything else? What about, what about 8? Who thinks it's good to set n to 8? Because remember, I have eight, 8 execution contexts. So if I get 1,000 requests, you're going to set n to 1,000. Um, what about, we all agree that it seems unreasonable to set n to 1 because I have 8, eight execution contexts. I should run in parallel. Um, any other numbers? Did anybody come up with any other numbers? No? Okay, so let's start by talking about what if n is 8. So if n is 8, that's good. If we get a lot of requests, let's just assume if I get 1,000 requests, I'm going to put all the requests in a queue, and I'll have my 8 processes pull the next request off the queue. So I'm going to use all the cores. That's really good. But is there a problem? Is there anything wrong with what, if you see anything wrong, oh, inefficient, about n equals 8, given this code, and my big hint is this right here. What's going to happen when one of these cores is reading the file from disk? What happened when one of the cores was reading memory? It was stalled, right? Now imagine you're reading it from disk. You're stalled for a really long time. So, one answer would have been, we're going to set n. So one, okay, so one valid answer is we're going to set n to 8 <coughs> because we want to use all the cores. <coughs> the next answer is, when one, of the core, when one of the processes stalls, waiting on very slow disk, we would like to run and service another request. We would like to multi-thread. So another answer would be, let's use 8 times some small number. And now the third answer was, let's just create one thread for every, uh, uh, every request that comes in. And there's some, good, I, there's some good parts of that idea, and there's some maybe not so good parts of that idea. 
So I'm going to start with the not so good parts of the idea, and then we'll talk about the good. So the not so good is what happens if I get one million requests. I'm going to create one million processes, and all of them are going to have various variables in state. And I might, and all of those processes are going to try and share the same caches. So a lot of my variables will get evicted from cache. Or maybe I even run out of memory altogether. So I have a little bit of a problem. If I create thousands of threads or thousands of processes, it might be kind of inefficient because they're all going to conflict with each other. But there is one good thing about making a, a thread per... Oh, and then the other problem is that I have to boot up a thread every single request, which can be sometimes a little slow. But there is one very good thing about well, that suggestion. And so imagine that I get, let's say I decide to create 16 processes. Right? I'll allow every pro, half the processes to be waiting on disk while the other processes work on requests. Now what happens if all of those requests, you know, what is your favorite movie? What is your favorite movie these days? Transformers. Transformers, okay. So Transformers, about two hour movie. Maybe, maybe two gigabyte download. It's, it's stored on his server. He's storing videos and movies. Now. <laughs> and so imagine that everybody wants to watch Transformers. So everybody sends a request. And now we have, if I only had eight processes, there would be eight, the, sorry, if I only had 16 processes, there would be 16 processes you know, delivering the data for 16 requests. The rest of the requests get queued up. And then let's say I hit your server because I want to download a song or I want to download a web page. It might take two seconds. So I have to wait in the queue behind all of these uh, uh, movie downloads. And it might take a very long time. So one good reason to spawn uh, a worker per request is just to allow concurrency, to allow short, easy to do requests to be serviced very quickly so they don't get behind the big request. That would be one good answer. Okay. So web servers actually do a lot of the things that you described. Some web servers spawn a request uh, process per request. Other web servers will have a pool. And uh, uh, Apache, so does it, uh, have you heard of the Apache the web server? Very popular web server. And so what Apache does is it tries to, to make a balance. One answer is that it would like to just spawn a process per request so that it doesn't create, uh, oh, sorry, sorry. It, it wants to keep a, a pool of processes around. So it doesn't have to create a new process for every request, because that can be expensive. But at the same time, it doesn't want to fix the size of n. So what it will do is if Apache has a very few requests, it'll make n really small. It'll create like uh, a pool of size two. And if new requests come in, it will increase the size of the pool. It will spawn new, request, uh, new processes. And it will always tend to contain uh, uh, a fixed size pool of a few idle workers. So it will always try and create maybe a, a few extra processes and you have requests. So that when a new request comes in, there's always a process to handle. Up until a point. And then up until that point, then it will stop creating new processes and stick all of the extra requests in a queue. So if I hit Apache with a bunch of requests, at some point, all of the processes will be busy, Apache will, will enqueue the rest of the requests, and the website will slow down. It will have longer response times because requests have to sit in the queue before they get processed. One question that's not related to performance at all is notice that I wrote process. Here, like an actual process in a computer. I didn't write thread. And it's very common in, uh, in web servers to actually get parallelism by spawning entirely new processes that work together and communicate via sockets or other communication mechanisms. Uh, also, the, uh, most web browsers like Chrome or uh, Safari or Firefox, they actually create a process per tab. Do you know why it's processes and not threads? 
It's a very practical reason. It's not performance. The idea? Well, in one square and not crash. Right. The whole process will crash. That's correct. So it's more it's a very practical reason. Like for example, imagine that you have uh, you're you're writing a web server and maybe it's using a library of code that you downloaded off the internet. So you don't know if that library is very stable. Um, so if that process crashes, or sorry, if it's a thread and that thread crashes, then it takes down the entire process. So if my whole web server is in the same process, any one thread, any one request that causes a crash will bring down the whole web server. And that's not very good. Um, the other thing is that sometimes web servers use libraries, and the libraries are not thread safe. They may not make use of locks and things like that. So if you put them in different processes in their own address space, well then you can use these libraries in a parallel fashion because they are running in different processes. So those are some uh, ideas. Uh, now, Apache you can also put in a mode where if you want to save a little bit of memory, every one of the request handlers can be done in a thread rather than a process as well. That's called the worker module. Okay, so up until now we've only talked about the world's simplest web server. And what the Ars web server has only done is, is it served up files. But almost every website we hit today is not just delivering files to us. It's running code. It's querying a database. It's performing a service. And so really when these requests come in, these worker processes are running a bunch of code. Uh, and it might be Python or Node.js, JavaScript code, or PHP. Um, and so the response is not a static page, but the result of application logic. And you can imagine you know, how much code actually needs to run to maybe host an entire page uh, like this. Right? Um, these websites are making all these requests to different databases. They're running code that might suggest what you want to see. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on when you make a request to say, give me the home page. Um, of Weibo or any of these major websites. Right? Um, another example is imagine what mobile servers are doing every day uh, in terms of all the requests that come in. So it's, most of us write websites in scripting languages. And we talked about why we like scripting languages a few lectures ago. We like to be productive. We like to be able to, to write applications very quickly. Um, but the problem with some of those scripting languages is, quite, is that they are quite slow. So um, PHP is a common language for writing websites still today, you know, <laughs> surprisingly. Um, and uh, PHP is surprisingly slow. Uh, in fact, I wrote the uh, course website a few years ago, the main course website. It, it's written in PHP, and I don't know why I did that. but. I did that because it was very quick to write it in PHP. But it's shockingly slow. So WordPress, uh, do you know WordPress? WordPress is just the, the, uh, the content management system. Everybody uses it for their websites and blogs. It can serve up about 12 requests per second per core um, on a modern core. 12 requests per second per core. In assignment three, you are processing graphs with hundreds of millions of nodes in a second or two. Right? Hundreds of millions of nodes were touched in a few seconds. Interpreted WordPress can serve up 12 pages per second per core. It's crazy. Like, I can compute, I don't know, I mean, I can solve the world's problems in 12, you know, 12 problems per second. Um, with only a database size of a thousand posts. If you say WordPress, give me this post, it can query the database, transform it into HTML, get it back to you. Um, MediaWiki, which is an old wiki site, was about eight requests per second per core. Right. So yes, there's a lot of interest in making scripting languages far more performant. And you see, like Google has put a lot of investment into JavaScript to make JavaScript much faster. Uh, Maybe, maybe your visibility into Facebook's activities may not be as much as, as mine, but Facebook has put a lot of work into uh, compilers and language support to sort of compile PHP into binary on the fly and things like that. 
because uh, uh, Facebook was entirely a PHP shop when it got started. So we had, they had like the world's most PHP code. Okay, so if we don't want to spend three or four years to write a faster compiler, and we don't want to rewrite our web server in C or C++ or Java, what can we do to increase the throughput beyond 10 requests per second? And let's say we wanted to get to 100 requests per second. What would be the easiest thing to do if I gave you, I don't know, 10,000 RMB and said, your website currently runs at 12 requests per second. Make it 100. And you need to have the answer. You need to have a solution for me in about four hours. I'm your boss. I know that everybody is about to hit our website because we are about to get very popular. You need to run faster, and you need to do so tomorrow. What would you do if you had a little bit of money? What's the title of this course? Right? You would go run because I can I I can par like, if I get more users, all of those requests are parallel, right? They're all independent. So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to go spend a ton of money to pay a software developer for six months to write faster code. I'm just going to go buy more servers because <laughs> those are very cheap, <laughs> very cheap. So I'm going to go buy a bunch of servers. And I'm going to have one server that is the load balancer. And whenever requests come in, my load balancer is going to pick one of the servers and send the request to that server. So notice how I have one load balancer, one database, and a whole bunch of servers that get a request like show Kvon's, <coughs> you know, show Kvon's homepage. All the application logic to do that runs here, and there will be queries back to the database. Now, we only have one database, because if uh, this request modifies the data, I don't want to keep a bunch of copies of that data around, because they may be inconsistent. So I'm going to say that anything that modifies data happens here. Anything that accesses and reads data can happen completely in parallel. Now, when the first time when people started scaling websites, any website has what is called a session. So when you log into a website, your browser keeps a cookie. And what a cookie is, is a little piece of information that says, this website, every time I request a page from the website, I will also send the website cookies which is information about you. So that information by, might be a unique number identifying you. And every web server will have a little, uh, in memory, will keep some information such as this unique number corresponds to this user. So, <clears throat> and this is just kept in memory. And every once in a while you have to re-log in and that's because your session has expired. So the problem when I start, um, replicating web servers is that imagine I log in on this server and so now this server says that this ID is Kvon and then the next time I request a page I click a link that I like the load balancer routes me to a different server so this server does not know that I've logged in so web servers have to be a little bit careful like one example would be the load balancer could always route my browser request to the same server. But that would create a problem with parallelism, which would be maybe unequal load on the servers. Um, so what most websites these days do, because databases uh, uh, I've gotten a little faster, is that the login information is actually now just stored in the database. So the mapping of session key to who the user is is just stored completely in the database. So workers are completely stateless. 
meaning that if a worker crashed, it wouldn't matter at all. The, lo the, load, the load balancer would send future requests to this server, and they would all get the information about users and data from the data. Okay. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, well, Kpon made this very easy because he only created one database. Now, what happens if, uh, if we have a whole bunch of servers? Let's say I have thousands of servers, and they're all accessing the same database, and we might get bottlenecked by the database. And so the first thing that you would do is you like in the web server community is you would say, <coughs> I'm bottlenecked by my database. This is a problem. And you would say, well, I'm going to go buy a bigger computer for the database because I don't want to write any more code. <laughs> So you're going to buy a big computer, for, like these might be simple servers, like six cores. And then you go buy a big 32 core or 64 core server for the database. And you pay a lot of money for an Oracle or expensive professional database that has been tuned up to scale to 32 or 64 cores. Because people do not like scaling databases. It's hard. You would take, you know, you have to know ideas from this class to paralyze a database. So the first thing you do is you say, you know what, my cheap uh, free open source database is too slow. <laughs> I'm going to go start paying for my database now. <laughs> and because I'm paying for my database, it will scale to more cores. <laughs> That's the first thing everybody does. And at some point, you get tired of paying so much money for your database. You're like, oh, my database is too expensive. I need to be smarter. Now you start thinking about the problem yourself. And so one answer would be <coughs> to replicate the database. So what I've done here is I've said, you know, there's most things, a lot of things on the web are reads. They're not writes. Most of the time if I view a web page, I'm asking for a lot of information. I'm not looking to update a lot of it. So a common scheme is to keep one database, sure, no problem, all the writes go here, but then we're going to keep copies, copies of that database that can only be read from. So then remember that the, this is the, basically this is the cache coherence problem, is that when we kept copies of, of data in caches, whenever there were writes, we had to be careful that the other copies had the latest value. Well, you can make things much easier if the other copies can never take writes, and all the writes go here. So, some requests, if it's a read-only request, it can go to any of the databases. If it's a write, it must go to this database. And every once in a while, this database's updates will get propagated to the read-only databases. So it's a very simple form of coherence. So step one, is just try and take the traffic off of the database that's read-only. Now what happens if you're still bottlenecked by the database? Let's say you have a lot of writes or something like that. Well, how could you make, how would, how could you paralyze the database in a very easy way? What was that? I can, uh, shard it? Yeah, so I can, what I can do is, well, how about I just divide the data in the database across a bunch of servers? So this is often called sharding. Every piece of the database is a different shard. So what I decided to do here, if this is, a, let's say it was a, like a Weibo account, let's say I'll have this database server, will have all of, half of the users, users with the last name N through Z. And this server would be the first half of the users. And this other server might be um, another database for a particular type of things, like logging all of the clicks. So the next idea of scaling the database is partition your data and separate out the different types of accesses. So users might go in a normal database, clickstream data that's just writes only might go into a completely different database. Because clickstream, you know, analyzing clicks is something maybe you only need to read once a month if you want to uh, think about advertising. So, do you think my partitioning 
of the database by first name, or sorry, by the first letter of the last name is a good one. Can you think of a problem with what I have done? Especially for Chinese names. <laughs> this would not work very well uh, if these were all Chinese names. Because there would be a very uneven distribution, right? Many people would be on one server and not on the other. What would, how would you, can you think of a better way to partition the data? I should probably run the names through uh, a hash function or something like that. So I should take, I should have a hash function that takes as input the name and outputs one or zero with, uh, with a uniform distribution. And then I can get uh, a more even distribution. Another answer might be, let's say that we had a social graph, like it was a social network. You might want to consider putting users that were friends of each other on the same database. Because then all the information you wanted to access was local to the same server. And maybe that might improve performance. Now if I go back to uh, this, this Weibo feed, I should have probably actually shown Alibaba here. I was looking at Alibaba last night, but the page was too complicated. <laughs> um, it's because if I'm shopping, up until now, have we been talking about throughput or we have, been, have we been talking about latency? All my optimizations have been about improving throughput or improving latency. Throughput. I'm like, more requests per second, more requests per second, absolutely. But if this was you know, an e-commerce site, if I was trying to buy something, I get really frustrated when I'm trying to buy something and I click and the site is slow. And I have to wait a little bit. And it's definitely been shown that um, the longer the latency is on the response time for a page, the, more, the less people use your website. So for example, Baidu and Google and these search companies, they have the technology to deliver significantly higher quality search results. But they have time and time again shown that people prefer and click a lot more if the search results come back, let's say, in 50 to uh, milliseconds or less. So pretty good results in 50 milliseconds are almost always better than better results in like two seconds or a second and a half. So latency actually also matters a whole lot in websites. So the next optimization that I'm going to do, we've just scaled our database, we've done all this stuff, and now I'm going to try and improve the latency of giving you a page by parallelizing the actual act of making that page. So here I took a screenshot, not from Alibaba, but from Amazon. And on Amazon, I have all the products that I'm searching for uh, at the top, because I was looking for cash coherence textbooks. <laughs> um, and then they have a bunch of recommendations for other books and movies that I should, should buy. In fact, I had just watched James Bond right before I made this last year, and so they're recommending a James Bond movie. Um, and then, of course, there are ads over here. So this page has a whole bunch of, of pieces and Amazon will parallelize the creation of this page across different servers. So for example, it will have one server that does recommendations. It will have other servers that do uh, news feeds and, uh, and uh, notifications. Maybe another server is responsible for advertising service. So the way it will work is that requests will come in. The load balancer will send it to one of my web servers. And the process of running the web server, of, of, of making this page, will create a bunch of other parallel requests to other web servers that are specialized to do different parts of the computation. Okay, so now you have a website, and it's pretty cool. It's pretty optimized, it's looking good. And, but now, you know, I'm your boss again, and I, and I said, make it go faster, 
And so you went out and you bought 1,000 servers. And the next day, it's going really fast. And I'm like, great. So we're making a lot of money, selling a lot of products. But I get the bill later. I'm like, ooh, that's a lot of servers. <laughs> that's really expensive. So the question is, how many servers should you need? Right? So most web traffic is very bursty. So I'm, uh, I'm using a lot of US website examples here because it took me a long time to find the data and I couldn't do it again for Chinese websites because the data doesn't exist and also I can't read them. Um, so I'm going to give you some examples from Amazon. So Amazon is a major US shopping website. You can think about it as Alibaba, basically. Um, and here is Amazon's page views per day over two years. And what do you notice? So this is the, uh, the winter Christmas holidays in the United States at the end of the year. And you can see that Amazon, and this is pretty old data now, they don't publish this data as much anymore. The website, there were a lot of requests right around the major holiday of the year because everybody's buying gifts for other people. Here's another website, which is a major, which is a, a news blog. And you're like, well, every day people read news. So the number of requests per day or acro across the year is about the same, right? Much more smooth. But this is news. So, so this is like requests per month. And if I, if I drill down and I say, well, what about requests per day? It's also really bursty. Because people are reading the news a lot when they're at work, because they're bored and not working. And when they go home for the weekend, they're not on their computer spending all their time reading news. So even uh, all, most websites have very bursty traffic. It is not smooth. Um, other examples would be social networks like Facebook or, uh, or Weibo. They have usually big bursts of traffic near holidays. And in the United States, it's funny because the big bursts are actually New Year's Eve. New Year's, makes sense. Uh, and also US Halloween, when everybody dresses up in costumes. So everybody takes pictures of everybody else. So that's where their two big bursts are. Um, for example, things like uh, microblogging services like Twitter or Weibo, they will burst when a big event happens. Like if something important happens, everybody starts talking about it, and they will have and this is not data for you because you did not take exams, but this is data for my class's website for the last three semesters at CMU in the spring. So it's hard to see, but this is January, February, uh, and all the way until February 26th. And so I, I have you know analytics on the course webpage, so I know how many pages. So what do you think happens usually at the end of February? <laughs> So this is a course from January to May, and we have something at the end of February. What do you think it is? It's midterm exam. Yes, exactly. Um, and so this is you know, what happens. And so now this burst is not enough that I need to go buy more web servers. And if I had to, I would say tough luck students. You know, like you should have started studying earlier. Uh, but it's kind of interesting that um, Page views per student in the 48 hours before the midterm has been almost within 1% of each other for the last three years. <laughs> A very interesting statistic. It's <laughs> like students study almost exactly the same amount <laughs> from year to year <laughs> across the class. Okay, so the problem that I'm starting trying to talk about is that site load is bursting. So if I'm your boss and I say, we don't want the site to be slow. We need to buy enough servers for whatever month we really expect a lot of traffic. That's going to be a lot more servers than what we need most of the time. And if instead we decide to buy servers for the average case, whenever we get a lot of traffic, our site will crash or be really slow because it doesn't have enough throughput. And being slow in a burst is really bad because your site is bursting at the time that is the most important. <laughs> so at the time that you're the most important, like when everybody wants to buy something, that's the time you don't want to crash. <laughs> it's okay to crash when nobody cares about buying something. 
So it's very important to be able to handle the load. And this gets us to our next idea, which does not exist in a lot of parallel computing or supercomputing, which is the notion of that we should start thinking about servers not as a piece of hardware that we go buy, but as something we can go rent. Just like if I need more water today, I can just use a little bit more water and I'll pay a little bit more. Or if I need you know, more uh, electricity today because I'm running, you know, watching a TV show all day, I'll pay a little bit more. But I certainly don't have a specific amount of water or electricity that I can use every day, or, or bandwidth, even. So what an Amazon started is, so Amazon had this problem. And because they did not want to miss the Christmas holiday season, they had to buy enough servers for the red line. And they had the rest of the year, they had all of these idle servers. And they were like, well, we can turn them off. Um, but they said, well, how about we start renting them to other people? So the solution was to make um, these machines available to rent on an hourly basis. So if I want a computer, I can go to Amazon or Google or many of the cloud providers in China, all the same services exist, and I can say, I want a Linux box with this image, boot it up, and I want it ready two minutes from now and I want 32 cores. And they will deliver that to me, and they will hand me an IP, and I'll just log into that computer and do whatever I want with it. I'm root. So for example, today on Amazon, um, uh, this is Amazon servers located on the US West Coast. And they are uh, some of those servers are located in a state called Oregon. Oregon is a very pretty state that has very big rivers. And so there are a lot of dams on those rivers that produce electric power for very cheap. So Amazon has put its servers there because there's cheap electricity. So if I go buy servers in this part of the United States, well, I can go buy a server that has, uh, so vCPU, this is like hyperthreads, that has 32 hyperthreads, so basically 16 Intel cores, um, with uh, 60 gigabytes of RAM, two SSDs, and I can rent that out for about $1.70 US cents an hour. Or if I want a really small computer, let's say, like my laptop, eight hyperthreads with 15 gigabytes of memory, I can rent that for about 40 US cents an hour. And I can rent machines that have GPUs as well, or I can rent some really fancy machines like one with 32 hyperthreads and two terabytes of memory? Yeah, uh, for $13 now, pretty expensive. So the way this works now is we have my, well, I have my website, and I'm monitoring how many requests per second I get. And so at some point, let's say something happens. Let's say that somebody tweets or blogs about our website. So there's a really cool class and you should go check out the website and watch some of the lectures. So somebody says, oh, go watch the lectures. And a whole bunch of people around the world say, ah, I'll go click on that link. And now all of a sudden we have a lot of requests. Way more requests than we have throughput. So let's think about what this is going to happen. What's the, what is this going to do to my website? And imagine that I have a website that let's just say can do uh, uh, 10 requests per second across, let's say, one request per second per server, and I have 10 servers. And let's say I start getting 100 requests per second. What is going to happen to the website? What will be the experience of the users? The first 10 requests, no problem. Get onto the servers, they get that immediately. The 11th request has to wait for one of these to finish. The 12th request has to wait for two of these to finish. So while, so this is just like your uh, homework problem, where we had three pipeline stages and they were running at different rates. I asked you the latency. So think through what's going to happen here. And let, okay, so let's say that, that I can run at, I'm going to change the numbers. Let's say that it takes 10 seconds no, it takes one second to process a request, and I have 10 servers, so that means I can do 10 requests per second. 
We'll talk about this as soon as I get back. Okay, we are back. Okay, so here's a problem I want everybody to think about. It's the last major concept of the course. So I've set this problem up where I want you to imagine that I have 10 servers. And my servers process requests. It takes one second to finish a request. So with 10 servers, my latency of request is one second. My throughput is... What is my throughput? 10 requests per second. And now, I've told you that we're going to say that we are very popular. Everybody likes our, our, our class. And we are getting 100 requests per second, page views per second. So I want you to think about what happens. And remember, every time a request gets, comes, it gets put in the queue. And then one of the servers will take the first element in the queue whenever it's ready. So at time t equals 0, let's say the size of the queue is 0. Okay. And so if a request <coughs> arrives right now, how long will it take before it is done? One second, right? One second. So the wait time is one. Now let's think about the state of the system. Can everybody see? Okay. okay. One second later. So one second later, 10 servers have finished one request each. But what is the size of the queue? After one second, a hundred things have arrived, ten of them have fi uh, finished. So the size of the queue, let's say, is 90. So now, if a new thing arrives at t equals 1, how long does it wait? What is the latency of this, of a new request now? What do you think? What is it? Say, 9, and how did you compute 9? So I have 90 elements in the queue, and I know it will take 9 seconds for those servers to finish everything in the queue. Plus, there needs to be one more second to process the, the thing that just showed up. So technically, yeah, you're right, but technically it's a latency of 10. Now after another, se so after 2 seconds, what is the state of the queue? So after two seconds, how many things have arrived? 200. How many things have been completed? 20. So the state of the queue is 180. So the 200th and, and first request that arrives at t equals 2, what is its delay? Its delay is 18 plus 1, 19 seconds. So what's going to happen? if my website cannot keep up with the request rate. The queue is just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And the wait time will go up and up and up and up. The queue will just get infinitely long. So what do you think a denial of service attack is? A denial of service attack is hitting a website with many, many requests. So the website's queues fill up. So you haven't really crashed the site, you've just made it so slow that any legitimate request takes forever because it sits in the queue for so long. Now, usually we're not going to have an infinite size queue. What will we do when it gets uh, big enough? We will just stop, stop taking any more requests. We will drop the request and it'll be air, you know, the, your website will just tie, tie down. So by adding more servers, oh, so, so yeah, so I wanted to just point out is that if the latency, uh, the site has a capability of processing R requests per second, and the queue length is L, well, that means the time in the queue is length of queue over request per second. That's exactly the computation that you all figured out here. Technically, this is called Little's Law. Okay. So under heavy load, with many requests per second, site latency goes way up because there's time waiting in queues. 
how does site throughput change? Does not change at all. Exactly. So let's say that now I decide to create a whole bunch of more web servers. So I, did, I drew a lot of web servers, and I drew a lot of web servers to increase my throughput. And if I increase my throughput, what's going to happen here? If I have a lot of elements in the queue, if I make my throughput equal to my arrival rate, what happens to my queue? Does it get longer? Does it get shorter? Or does it stay the same? Shorter? Are you sure? So think about it. it is the queue's getting longer and longer and longer. And my boss is like, no, oh no, oh no, oh no, the latency is going way up. Let's add more servers. So I rent 100 more servers <coughs> so that my throughput now equals the arrival rate. So that means the queue is, it's not getting any bigger, but it's still really long. So I actually have to add more servers to get a throughput much higher than the arrival rate so that the queue begins to go down. Right? And then once the queue goes down to get the latency back to normal, then I can turn off some servers to match the arrival rate to keep the weight, and then the queue will stay small. So after a while, the request rate will drop, and I'll decide to start uh, turning off those servers that I rented, because they don't want to pay a lot of money for them. So there are a lot of services out there. Almost any cloud service provider these days allows you to rent servers. Um, these are some of the US companies that allow you to do it. And the uh, servers that I showed you here, you can rent basically per hour. And if you decide to buy many hours up front, it's a little cheaper. And the new thing is this thing called um, microservices. So Amazon and Google now allow me to rent compute time at the granularity of uh, milliseconds. So I can pay by the millisecond. So it's very, very cool. Uh, so uh, Google, Amazon, Lambda, I can't remember what the Google's name is. But it means that I just give Amazon my code, my Python or my PHP code. They will run the load balancer and send the request to my code. And my code, it's going to call my function. And it's going to time how long my function is running. And it will, pay, it will, it will uh, charge me only in milliseconds for when my uh, so you pay per millisecond gigabyte. Like it means you get a core for this many milliseconds and this many gigabytes of memory. Super interesting. And everybody is starting to use it that way. So here, you have to buy a server and you run your own Linux instance. There, you just hand Amazon your function and you let Amazon run it. Super interesting. So that's like kind of the new thing that's getting very popular right now. OK, so so far, I've talked about parallelism and scalability and load balancing. And I want to, of course, say a few words about communication and memory. So let's go back to our basic site configuration. Request, one web server, and a database. And here's some PHP code that is actually from the website of this course, which is a very common thing, which is select, this is a SQL query. Select from users, find the record of my user, select the, uh, the user, Kalon, um, and then I'm going to get an array, I'm going to get like, all the information about me, and then I'm going to write some PHP code which creates a web page that has my name in it. Uh, so the information flow looks like uh, remove data from the database, put, or, or, you know, select data from the database, turn it into a PHP array, Take the PHP array, access it in some code, and generate some HTML. By the way, this is why there are only 10 requests per second. So doing a database lookup, then creating a PHP object in the interpreter, and then using the PHP object in the interpreter to print some strings. And this code is repeated for every web page on the site, right? Like, for example, every website at the top will say, hello, Kayvon, you are logged in. Um, and so this code is repeated on every single website, or every single page. And it's fairly expensive. 
So the solution that almost every website uh, employs, because remember the database is a little slow and it's, it's expensive to buy a fancy one, so we want to keep work out, off the database whenever we can. So what we're going to do is we're going to cache the results of this computation. <coughs> So I'm going to store off the string. I'm going to say that uh, this string of HTML that took some, some logic to produce, I'm going to store it off. Um, and I'm just going to give it a unique ID. So I might generate an ID which is, corresponds to KVUG's login string. And I'm going to stick that key value pair in a key value store, which is a very specialized data store where all the data is stored in memory, so it's really fast, and it's essentially a big hash table. I'm going to put the key, which is you know, Kvon's top bar on the website, and, I'm going to, and the value is going to be the HTML code. And now, I'm going to store that in memory in a hash table on some server sitting over here. And now my website logic is going to look like this. So I'm going to get the user ID sent to me from the browser, I'm going to say, if my hash table has the HTML string for this user ID, I'm going to use that to make the web page. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and make the database query to get my full name and make the HTML and so on and so on. And because accessing data in memory is very fast, and querying a database and, writing and, and running interpreted PHP is very slow, Sites do this a whole lot. So they may have a couple of web servers, and they may have a database, and you might have sharded the database or replicated the database for performance. But almost every website will also keep a bunch of servers whose purpose is only to run to keep these hash tables in memory. So that large pieces of processing a request can just be looked up in the cache. So I'm using the term memcached here. That's not memcached. That is a <laughs> That's the name of a piece of software called memcached D, where D is the daemon because it's always running in Linux. Um, so that is a major idea of most of these websites, is cache everything that you can cache. And you cache the results of computation. And then the other thing that gets cached is if I go to any major website. Now, I go to WeChat, I go to Facebook, I go to sports websites. All of them are streaming video and images that we're all uploading. And most servers, it's very expensive to send an image or a video across the internet from your web servers. So the last piece of the puzzle is I'm going to use a bunch of specialized content delivery networks, CDNs, to store all of the big data. So for example, if your website's hosting uh, uh, songs, or big images, or videos, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pay some company to store those files, because those are read-only files. They never change. And they're going to store those files using sophisticated networks where they're going to keep servers in different locations. For example, there may be some servers in Beijing, there may be some servers in Shanghai, there may be some servers in Europe. And so if a user from Europe hits your website, and your website loads up an HTML page with links to some videos or images, my website is going to say, oh, this is a European user. The links to those uh, videos, I'm going to give them a URL for the servers that are storing the videos, a copy of those videos, in Europe already. Because now they'll get higher bandwidth. Um, it'll be lower cost, because we don't have to pay for bandwidth across the, the uh, the world, and you'll see every major website using this technique right now. So this is from my Facebook page. Um, and if you look at the URL, this is the URL, facebook.com URL. It's just like a picture that I took in uh, last year. And if I right click this image, so you cannot see this because you are not a friend of mine. If I right click this image and I say, show me the URL, the URL is not facebook.com. The URL is this content delivery network. So it's read-only data. And if you could access that server, you could actually see that image without being one of my friends or having access to see the data. So it's kind of like private with a link. So all of the images are pushed out around the world. 
and copy to these content delivery networks. And Facebook just generates URLs to them. And so the data is not coming from Facebook every time. And WeChat will be doing the same thing, and all these companies will be doing the exact same thing. So if I put it all together, here's my whole scaled website. <laughs> I have some users in two different cities, let's say one in San Francisco, uh, somebody else at CMU in Pittsburgh. Their request will get to the front of my website. My load balancer will choose some web servers. Web server will start working on the request, and processing that request might involve accessing uh, multiple other web servers, such as web servers that are caching the data, one or more databases, and I'll probably produce web pages to send back to the users that have links, if there's big images or videos or audio, to copies of that data stored in CDNs that are close to the user. So all of this is going on to parallelize a modern website and make it as efficient as possible. So you see a lot of the concepts from the course, right? You see parallelism, you see workload balancing, you see very strong uh, requirements for locality. And locality doesn't mean in cache, it actually means in servers, wherever the user is, in the, close to where the user is in the world. And you see specialization of servers for performance, such as one server for just recommendations, or one server for just ads. So all of the, the ideas are there. And so some people kind of think, oh, web scripting is just dumb programming, it's not very intelligent. But scaling a website is a very interesting parallel systems problem. Um, and uh, there are some really good case studies on the web that describe how some major websites are implemented. Like, I'm shocked at how fast uh, WeChat is, because you know, we're uploading video, everybody in this country is uploading video and images to WeChat all the time, and it just gets, it's sent immediately. So the number of servers that, that Tencent must have to make that as fast as it is, uh, is really, really impressive. And I bet that whoever is responsible for designing that system is doing a very, very good job. Okay. So, um, so that, is, that is the lecture today. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I have a few slides where I just want to wrap up before we are, we are done. So, so just one or two slides here. So, okay, so I, I will be flying back home tomorrow. Uh, or actually, I'm not flying home. I'm flying to Los Angeles because I have to go to a conference called SIGGRAPH, which is the major conference for graphics folks. Um, but I am already getting a little uh, uh, sad to leave, to leave uh, Chingma. You probably are very happy to be done with the course. Um, so if you take anything away from the 15 lectures, right, is I think it's that uh, for the foreseeable future, until we develop new ways of computing, <laughs> you know, maybe quantum computing, maybe uh, non uh moving away from silicon electronics to more biological inspired things. But for the foreseeable future, until we get a major change in how we do computing, um, the only way to run more efficient, more performant, is either through more parallelism, and not just more parallelism, but actually increasing specialization. Lots of chips, but also chips that are specialized for various tasks. And these are some examples we've talked about through the class. And even though today's lecture was not about using any one processor efficiently, we were assuming that we were using it actually so inefficiently with PHP that we needed hundreds of processors and thousands of servers. Um, most code that we run today is surprisingly inefficient. Assignment one, you showed that on 12 cores, you could run, I think it was something like, 40 times faster than if you just go use C code. 40 times, that's crazy, that's 40 times fewer servers. 40 times less payment to, to the company that you're renting servers from. In assignment three, you were processing graphs that had, uh, what was the biggest one, 200 million edges? Or was there a bigger one, 500 million edges? I mean, there's not too many graphs in the world that have more than 500 million things. And you were processing that on one computer in just a few seconds. So if you write good, efficient code, it's shocking what computers can do. <laughs> um, and so 
you have to understand how parallel computers work to get that kind of performance. And if you're interested in these types of topics and research, you know, major challenge going forward is it would be nice to not have to be able to work so hard to get that kind of performance. So major challenge in going forward is trying to make it simple for more people to write good, efficient code and it be very, inefficient, uh, very energy efficient and very performant. And I think it's very exciting. And I think it's very exciting not because, well, it's fun to make code go faster, but it's exciting because efficiency is going to be very fundamental to all the new applications of computing that don't exist yet, right? We will not have self-driving cars until we can get teraflops on teraflops of compute in a car because of how much work that vehicle will need to do to understand the world around them. You know, those vehicles will not be sending that video that they are taking up to the server and determining three seconds later that there's maybe a biker on a mobike right in front of the car. <laughs> this needs to be done immediately. And if you look at VR, if you look at speech recognition, if you look at AR, if you look at uh, supercomputing or security or being able to do things on a watch, everything that we're doing and I think the most exciting things are all about really efficient processing will make, make it possible. So, the issues that we've talked about are parallelism, scheduling that parallelism, and most of the time the problem was not how do I run in parallel. Most of the time the problem was how do I organize all the things running in parallel. Um, and in this class, sort of like what is unique is that you were able to see all of these issues not just at the scale of type of light but at the scale of your iPhones and the computers that you run on every day, or maybe even your, your smart watch in the future. So if this was exciting to you, um, I, I don't know the course of names at Jingwa, but, but they're you know, distributed systems. We'll talk about a lot of the issues that we talked about today and go into a lot more detail. Um, you could probably benefit from a proper computer architecture course. Um, compilers, operating systems, databases are all about scheduling and managing parallel work. Um, and there are many application areas that hopefully when you take computer vision or machine learning and you do a final project in the class, you can do something much more impressive than your, your friends because you know how to run it very, very efficiently. Um, so uh, I'd like to thank uh, our TAs who uh, did a very nice job making sure the assignments were running. Uh, Yang had to catch a flight this morning, so he's not here, but he, he wanted to say uh, goodbye to everybody. And I want to say uh, thank you to Ping and Chu. Um, and uh, they were uh, very helpful to making sure all of your assignments were running properly <laughs> on these web servers. Uh, and so I'd like to give maybe one or two tips just to, to end up. Is, is that, uh, so you said you're, you know, you're busy in the lab for the rest of the summer. Um, now that you've taken this course, you are perfectly prepared, you know, for, this is mainly for our undergraduates in the room. You are very well prepared to go talk to other professors at Tsinghua that are interested in parallel computing and may have some very interesting projects for you to work on. And I really encourage you to try and do that. Um, and because why? You know, why would you try and do this? So, so one point is that you're taking two, well, Maybe you're only taking one or two classes right now, but in the normal school year, you're taking three, four, five classes. And you don't get a lot of time to think very deeply about any one class. And research will force you to think very deeply about one thing. And it can be very fun. So you may want to consider maybe taking one less class, maybe two less classes, and spending some of that time with some of your professors in a lab. Um, for example, you, you know, I've been very impressed with the work that you've done in this class, and so the Tsinghua students are very smart, very good, but imagine how smart the PhD students are. <laughs> so now you get to work with your classmates that are undergrads, but if you go to a research lab, and the professor, you know, if it's a good professor, they'll get you working with the rest of their students. And now you get to work with master's students or PhD students, and they're even more experienced and even more smart, and you'll get to learn even more from them. And the last thing, you know, which is just fun that I've always liked, is 
if I'm taking classes, I'm learning things that other people have already figured out. It's really exciting. But other people have already figured it out. Whereas if you go work in a research lab, it's research. So your professors and the people you're working with are trying to figure out things that nobody knows the answer to anymore. Um, and so, you know, most students are like, oh, if I get really good grades in my classes, then I can get a really good job. Which is true, a little bit. But, you know, imagine if you know something, because you've been working on it in research, that nobody at Alibaba knows. You know, imagine how valuable you might be to Alibaba in that case. So, sometimes the way to get the best job is not necessarily get A's in all the classes but do one or two things really, really well. Um, and, and I think it just gives you a slightly different way of thinking. I, I think that uh, researchers think about problems differently than industry, and uh, it can be helpful to see how that works. So there are many opportunities here at Tsinghua, and I don't know all of them, but for example, you could go talk to Xu or Ping about the work that they do um, uh, in, in, <coughs> in, in ways Group. And they, you know, like you have an amazing opportunity in Waze Group because you get to work. You can, next year, you could probably be working on the biggest computer in the world, and very few students have that opportunity. Uh, for example, Ping. So, so that group last year won this thing called the Golden Bell Prize. The Golden Bell Prize is a prize that's given to sort of the most interesting big supercomputing application of the year. It's not necessarily the biggest. I would say it's probably the most interesting. And uh, so Ping, who's sitting right there, he was one of the winners. So I was reading about the winning team. Ping is not in the photo, because <laughs> I don't think you went to Supercomputer last year. Um, but his name is a winner. And that's pretty cool. You get to, to do some cool things, right? Um, just to give you a sense of what my PhD students are working on, we're doing a lot of, of fun stuff as well. Like, for example, I told you about one of the projects. So last year, one of my first year PhD pro, uh, uh, students, was upset about how hard it was to write Haline programs. So he wrote a paper that appeared at SIGGRAPH on automatically scheduling these Haline programs. And now that that technology is being in use at Google, and that technology is used apparently to process all the images that are uploaded on Android Google phones. <laughs> so that was, that was pretty cool. And that was a first year PhD student. Um, I have another student, Yang. Yang's research is actually about designing a new programming language for 3D graphics. And Yang works every day with NVIDIA um, to do that. Uh, so my other students are now working on, we talked about Apache Spark. And so we're working on a project to say, well, what would it be like if you wanted to do something kind of like Spark, but instead of analyzing text data, we were analyzing images or videos, which are much, much bigger. So I have some other students working on a project that's kind of like Apache Spark for video. And then I have other students that are just doing computer graphic stuff. Like uh, one of them is making a, a system for helping with uh, lighting design for big uh, theater shows. So very, very different kinds of computer graphics as well. So who knows? You know, if you go into a research lab, maybe you actually like it. Uh, and maybe you're like, you know what, this is kind of fun. Maybe I go to, to grad school too. There's some grad students in the room, so you can ask them why they decided to go to grad school. Um, and it is, it is a little unfortunate, but it is very true that the number one way to get into a good grad school, and I really almost shouldn't say number one way, but I really should say the only way <laughs> to get into good grad schools, is to have a letter of recommendation from a faculty member. And what a good re recommendation letter says, because you know, I read these every year on applications. It says that this student has been doing research with my PhD students. I have watched them do research for the last year or so. And I'm confident that they have what it takes to be a good researcher at the PhD level. They'll usually say, this is the project they were working on, and the, they, they've been running this, they've been work, running, leading this project, they're working on a paper, you don't have to have written a paper, but they're working on a paper. Trust me, this person knows how to do research, and, and I know that because I've watched him or I've watched her for the last year and a half in my lab. That's what the letters say, and if a person that is a good professor says that, most people in the world go, ah, okay, those are the type of people that we know will be very good in grad school. What 
most letters say is that this student took my class, got a really good grade, did some great work on projects, was top, of, you know, was close to the top of the class, clearly really smart, and I believe that they will do well in grad school. And at CMU, and I think other schools we have as well, it is called a DWIC letter. The DWIC letter uh, stands for did well in class. So what we see, we say, oh, this person did really well in class. But then we go, but that doesn't mean that they know how to do research. And so that letter doesn't hurt your application, but what happens is it just kind of just gets thrown away because it doesn't help us at all decide who are the best researchers. So, you know, that's, it's important. It's important. And if it's something that you're interested in doing, especially those of you that are done with year two and about to start year three, this is a good time to start thinking about those things. Maybe you want to try out a couple of different research groups so when your final year, you know you're on a project that you like. Um, there's a professor at CMU named uh, Moore Hulker Walter. She's actually written a very nice document about how to think about applying to PhD programs in computer science. And I think her document holds for both US universities, uh, European universities, and universities throughout Asia as well. And it includes like things like why should I even why do I even want to go to a PhD? Because I think a lot of people do a PhD, uh, maybe not for the right reasons. <laughs> they do a PhD because their parents have PhDs, or they do a PhD because it's very prestigious. Um, but I don't think those are very good reasons to do a PhD. Um, PhD is a lot of work and a lot of time, um, and you should really know why you want to do it before you do a PhD. Um, because there are many other options, right? So um, faculty always say, go do research, go do research, it's the hardest thing to do. But in fact, there are many other cool things you can do, right? Like you could start your own project. If you like some of the ideas in this course, there's probably at least 50 papers that I've put on the homepage of this website about leading edge ideas in the, in the field. You could go spend some extra time reading those papers and maybe implementing them. That would uh, allow you to speak very intelligently in a job interview or teach you some new things. Or you could do things like, you know, there's a, a great scene in, in China these days on startups. So more and more people are starting their own companies. And most, many good ideas for companies start when students are talking at universities. Uh, they get the start of an idea when they graduate. They say, okay, I'm going to go try and do this myself. If it doesn't work out, you know, oh well, that's not, not too much of a problem. So, you know, Baidu, Alibaba, these are big, powerful companies with many employees. You know, maybe you should try and start, start a company that beats them at something like that. Uh, so, and, and a lot of students are very, very concerned about maybe not taking as many classes and, and spending more time on some of these other things because they're like, well, what if nothing good happens? And, you know, there's a, there's a big risk, right? And, and I think that it's important to point out to students like Chinua students or you know, students that I teach back in Pittsburgh, that you are very lucky. You know, you are here, you are already going to have a, a Tsinghua degree, and you're going to have good grades from Tsinghua. So you're going to be fine. You know, if you want to go get jobs at Alibaba or Tencent or any of these big, great companies, you will be able to pass their interviews. So, um, you know, it's a good time now that you have basics in a lot of these courses to try and Start taking some risks, take some gambles, be a little bit ambitious about what you might want to do. Because, you know, you can always go back and get the rest of the other job later. This is a very good time to be uh, ambitious. So your professors, me and I think any professor at Tsinghua would tell you the same thing, is, is go be brave about what you do next. So um, that is my last slide. So thank you very much for uh, working really hard for five weeks. This was faster than how we do this at CMU, and I'm, I'm glad that everybody survived. Or maybe not everybody survived. Some people are not here on the last day. Um, so, so good luck, and uh, if you are ever uh, need any questions about, about parallel computing or have any questions about universities that I'm at, um, feel free to email me. I'm, you know how to email me. I'm kmonf at cs.cmu. Um, so uh, I'd be happy to tell you about any opportunities at CMU going forward. Um, starting next year, some of you, I think I'm told, I'm actually moving from CMU. I'm going to be a professor at Stanford starting next year. So you can also find me at Stanford as well. So I can help you know, 
connect you with the folks at CMU, at Stanford, or in some other places. So anyways, um, assignment three is handed in. There's nothing left to do. Um, enjoy the rest of your summer unless you are working in a lab. So thank you very much, and I will see you guys whenever I see you guys. So. Okay, time for a lot of now.